All right, so hello everyone. Welcome back to my channel. It's Corey Dowds of Eye of the Veda. Today I have a special little treat. I'm interviewing a friend of mine, Ashwin Balaji, and he is a, an astrologer in India. And what I think is so neat is that, you know, I've, we, we've been friends and colleagues for a couple years and it's very neat. I can tell he's very just a scholarly astrologer who really just loves to learn and just loves this quest for knowledge, just like me. And what's so neat is that I am a Westerner over here using Indian astrology techniques mainly. And of course, I study other things as well. And he is an Indian, but he's actually using a lot of Western techniques and Hellenistic and different things. And I don't even know all about it yet. So that's why I wanted to have him on and chat about this and just have a conversation about um you know how how cool it is to be so universal in this modern world where we can learn about these different things and um systems and we have access to so much information now so welcome to my channel ashwin thanks uh cory thanks for asking me and uh, i'm just glad to be here and and even more i'm just glad to be talking about this topic which kind of preaches inclusiveness at some level yes so, uh yeah Thanks. Thanks very yeah. much. So, you know, for those of you guys who uh, may not have uh, heard of him before, he we also did a video on uh, Carmina's channel like a year or two ago about millennial astrologers. And it was like, you know, me and you and um, Carmina and Fernando, people all around the world um, and all like younger guys and ladies and who do astrology. And yeah, that was a very fun video. So, you know, like I wanted to know a little bit about kind of what got you into the Western astrology traditions, being an Indian and being surrounded by all this other stuff. Um, tell me about that. You know, the uh, I think I, I did not even know that there was basically two zodiacs when I started uh, doing astrology because coming from a family of astrologers, we have a lineage of astrologers. And what they all knew was, you know, we calculate the zodiac based upon some Ayanamsa. So... Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I was exposed to. And we all do the same thing. And we have a tradition of doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's pretty much a prevalent. And, uh, you know, there is no question about it across India. So that's the only way astrology is done in India. Yeah. Um, you know, there might be a little bit of changes over the past uh, year or two. But uh, that's, that's very minor. So getting back to what I was talking about... Uh, I, I might have started serious astrology uh, in 2013 and, and 40, early 2014, but I was pretty much into astrology by 2011. And I was always fascinated as, as I told, I, I grew up, uh, you know, listening to what Rahu and Ketu does and what Saturn does. <laughs> so, you know, uh, so people kind of talk really uh, uh, blatant stuff and yeah. they're not afraid of, uh, you know, saying something like that. So that's how, that's basically how Indian uh, astrologers are and the mindset of Indians are, Indians are never, uh, although some 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 people never like, um, they, they want things to be sugar-coated. But most of the Indians kind of tend to want to know the truth and uh, that's, that's how astrology is done here. But uh, leaving all that aside, <laughs> sorry? It's more cut and dry. It's yeah, like, it's more cut and dry. People want to know what's going to happen next year. Will I get a car? Will I get married? Will I have a son or a daughter? Will I have uh, wealth next year? So they want really specific details. Yes. And no one will come and ask an astrologer of uh, whether uh, I'll be into spiritual uh, zone uh, mm -hmm. over the next year or will I be uh, psychologically more... Uh, free <laughs> without any psychological burden or something like that because uh, spirituality is pretty much uh, in the roots of Indian people and every family preaches uh, some kind of spirituality. Spirituality means different things to different people. So so it, I, I won't call it as non-existent but I would call it as uh, I would call it as something that's simultaneous activity of our lives. So people are more uh, oriented towards what's going to happen in a more tangible manner. So, yes. so you know, that kind of uh, helped me on my way to exploring my 
uh, you know, first scratches of the traditional Western astrology, or uh, let's say astrology that's practiced west of India, the west of yeah. India. So yeah. in 2017, uh, I think I think I should kind of give a lot of credit to Chris Brennan's podcast and my friend Lars Panaro uh, yeah. for exposing me to the traditional uh, astrology of the West. So this all started in uh, 2017 and uh, 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 simultaneously I was also uh, open to modern Western astrology uh, and I started reading Alan Oaken's Complete Astrology, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, which, is one, which is one of the very few modern Western astrology books that I've, I've read uh, till today. So since I started uh, getting exposed to Chris Brennan's work, Chris Brennan does basically everything. He's amazing. His podcast yeah. is a, yeah. yeah. His, pod, his those, podcast. Yeah. I have to jump in and say that, yeah, to, to those who watch my channel, if you're curious about Western astrology, go to Chris Brennan's channel and his the astrology podcast. You can get so much good, solid info on the Hellenistic, the ancient traditions. Sorry, keep going, but that's just such- No I just, problem. I, I think you were just saying what I wanted to say. Yeah. It's like he, uh, apart from Hellenistic and other traditions, he kind of- uh, is a curious student of uh, entire Western tradition, including the modern psychological and esoteric tradition as well. So there is no boundaries when it comes to Chris's podcast. So which is one of the good reasons, uh, uh, you know, which kind of helped me, in a in a way, uh, to kind of get explored to all at once uh, at a very basic level, even if not at a very deeper level. But when it comes to Hellenistic tradition, I think Chris Brennan is a master, and. Uh, Although I did not have much of contact with Chris Brennan at that point of time, uh, he helped me uh, with the you know with various things that I did, and uh, I, I I got in touch with Lars, and Lars has been a very important figure in my life in terms of uh, taking my astrology of the West to a new different level, and I started studying Hellenistic astrology, the study of fate and fortune written by Chris Brennan, and mm -hmm. yeah. that book was basically. Uh, yeah, uh, if you have the this yeah. book, yeah, it's a great book, you guys. This is a book that Chris wrote, and it's uh, really amazing. I haven't even finished it yet, but it's a really good book. Yeah, so uh, the the book is a masterpiece of Hellenistic astrological tradition, and the moment I started reading that book, uh, I was completely subscribed to the idea of Hellenistic astrology. And uh, later on, you know, I, I started dealing with a little bit of techniques and I, I, I did one entire series of Hellenistic astrology called Visiting Valence with Lars Panaro on my channel. That was how excited about I was in terms of what Hellenistic has to offer. And, uh, you know, I, I started, um, let's, let's not forget that Jyotish has been my fundamental. Yeah. Uh, it's my foundation. Vedanta is my foundation. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult for me to kind of uh, take that foundation of my mind. So whatever I think is kind of going to be like a Jyotishi, but I also implement some of the Western traditions uh, and techniques in my astrology. So for example, uh, when I started doing Hellenistic astrology or when I started reading Hellenistic astrology, I started implementing the concept of sect. Sect is a very basic concept in the Hellenistic tradition, which kind of differentiates the chart in the nativity into two types one being the diurnal nativity and the other being the nocturnal nativity based upon where your sun is placed either above the horizon or below the horizon. Okay, like above the horizon day birth means you have a diurnal. Like like based on like a day birth. Exactly, yeah. Birth. So, does, does that make sense? Yeah, uh, yeah, based on day birth and night birth. Yes, exactly. But uh, there is a little bit of nuance to that. Uh, we, we look at what where the sun is placed. If sun is placed above the... Uh, uh, ascendant descendant axis, the nativity is diurnal. And if sun is placed below the ascendant descendant axis, the nativity is nocturnal. So uh, this is a very fundamental technique throughout the Hellenistic tradition on, and also the Persian tradition. Uh, and this was, uh, let's say, th this was just basic foundation for the first 1500 or 1600 years of uh, all astrological traditions. Yeah. So. It, it just gave me a different perspective of how astrology can be done. And let, let's not forget that Parashara mentioned this uh, in form of Kalabala 
in uh, yeah. brihad parashara horror shastra yeah so but kalabala was a little bit tweaked or different from yeah. what it was actually done uh, in the hellenistic tradition yeah that, so, that uh, means- did you want to say something yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, that when you mentioned that that made me think, "Oh, wow, that's so cool because, you know, at some point in the last year, I wrote to my uh teacher and I was like, "Hey, you know, what do you think about this day and night birth stuff? Because when I read like the Yavana Jataka and the Briha Prashar, there are a lot of like they actually even say in in Briha Prashar that if it's a day birth, the sun is your father, but if you're born at night, Saturn is a karaka of your father. And Saturn actually becomes a a a father factor for you more if you're born at night." then in the day and i was like well that's a yeah. big that's a big yeah. deal and and then i th- i got to thinking i was like in ancient times the night and the day would be such a big dynamic that that would be we need to focus on that more so that's really cool um, i yeah. should study that exactly so uh, i mean it's uh, it, it did not take much time for me to kind of realize that there is a lot of uh, value that i can add to my own astrological armory from the west so uh, yeah. so why not kind of dive deep and just explore uh, the tradition because it's such a rich tradition and uh, the, there is the slight difference that uh, that kind of uh, uh, you know uh, explains uh, the beauty of both vedic and hellenistic tradition uh, is that Uh, hellenistic tradition is far more systematic and there are well laid out rules and uh, you know uh, but jyotish is an ocean and uh, you know you you cannot uh, you basically cannot uh, cover and understand everything in your one lifetime uh, if you want to completely you know uh, completely digest the entire idea of jyotish it's extremely difficult yeah. it's vast Hellenistic. but hellenistic astrology is vast let's not let's not misunderstand but the thing is that hellenistic is extremely laid out uh, yeah. it's it's systematic it's mechanical and the the rules are pretty clear and there is no ambiguity uh, as much as what is there in jyotish and that does not condescend either of the tradition it's just yeah. the nature of the tradition yeah. that's uh yeah that's being practiced so going back to sect uh just so people know if who don't understand kala bala kala is time and uh, bala is strength so it's it's determining uh the nature quality and strength of the planets based upon the time during which the native is born so uh so this idea of sect kind of gives two different flavors of nativities which kind of opened a completely new window which i was never aware of so b- maybe i was doing everything wrongly before i came to kind of know about sect because uh, you know I-, i can directly give you uh, an example where uh, i have saturn in my eighth house and w- one of the person uh, who knows also has saturn in the eighth house and both of us have oh wait uh, for both of us saturn happens to be the ruler of the 10th house and i have a very strong foundation in terms of my professional life but he does not have a very strong foundation of his professional life so he kind of has a uh, has a lot of breaks in his profession and he uh, he tends to kind of you know uh, uh, get carried away by the pressure that's that's being exerted at work on him so the difference is that saturn is a, a diurnal planet and for diurnal nativities saturn the malefic uh, the planet that has more malefic nature is kind of more constructive f- for those people who are born during the day on the other hand saturn is far more less uh, let's say less constructive rather than destructive so saturn is less constructive for those people who are b- uh, born by night so uh, so the difference in our nativities is, a, is that mine is a diurnal nativity and saturn although it's in eighth house as the 10th ruler it kind of promoted the deeds uh, of that house to have a little bit of uh, uh, you know solidity in what i'm doing rather than you know uh, you know as opposed to what is happening to the other person yeah. who has a little bit of difficulty in kind of uh, taking off uh, as a professional yeah so, that, makes, that makes sense yeah so these are little bit of uh, little nuances that kind of makes your astrology uh you know uh, more uh, spot on let's say or or far more uh, 
less amb- uh, less uh, what do i say whatever it may be but it's it's far it's more just, uh, yeah it's it's a, it's a, it's it just takes a notch higher than yeah. what we are doing generally but that's my feeling so i don't mean to say that you don't do good astrology with jyotish let's oh, no. misunderstand I mean, yeah you got to have a lot of tools in your tool belt you know I yeah. mean, just that uh, learning um <clears throat> I I was going to ask you about this other western book that goes into the outer planets in a minute and you know like the outer planets are something that Joytish doesn't talk about but I still study those and learn all about the you just got to get as many techniques and in, in your tool belt is how I look at it you know what I mean or like if I'm a painter I need as many brushes and as many colors and I need to be able to mix and really work with those as well as possible to be able to paint the picture that I need to paint for the person you know sure um but Yeah, those were all really well uh, elucidated points and I probably need to go and study the sex thing as well because I really am curious about day and night birth and I think that yeah, it's funny how Saturn would connect to the night uh birth as well, but okay, so yeah, so that um that does help me kind of understand why you're into the western astrology traditions and that leads me to another question is yeah, so for me um like vedanta and yogic spirituality really is a lot of the main reason that i always kind of gravitate to the jyotish stuff but see i didn't live in india and i didn't grow up around a whole family like you but i know you're a fan of shrimad bhagavatam written by kamala subramanian so I'm big, fan, big fan of that <laughs> yeah. oh, so you know, <laughs> so, you know the, the, there's not much of a difference between us in terms of how we do things but it's just the lenses that we wear Uh, I, I think what's funny is that I um and I have um I have some I have a uh, Mars and and some planets that connect to my ninth house that are sort of like cruel planets but they're in good good condition but it's like I had to go harder to get the truth to get the answers I had to look for it a little bit more than my family or the people right around me and that's kind of even shown in my natal chart but it so it's kind of funny that you already had that and so to you the spirituality didn't need to have that association as much uh, um and to me a lot of the western astrologers at first a lot of the people I was meeting that were doing that were not that on top of it so it was almost like god wanted me to go towards the more of the yogis and the real vedic astrologer people but then after a while that i got i got through all that and then i realized oh wait no <laughs> there's a lot more to it um yeah yeah so it, it's really kind of funny how it is um and I just yeah I want to be 100% clear that there's just like a number of different lenses that you can use so yeah. it's not yeah it's not about which one is the best but okay so now there's another question so as you as you probably have learned like even a lot of the western traditions confirm the idea of reincarnation kind of in their systems right yes the the basic idea of reincarnation is uh, very much you know uh, documented in the works of plato especially yeah. if you read the republic of plato uh, uh, you know and one more thing is that you wouldn't find so much of a difference uh, a reading uh, about reincarnation in an upanishad or reading about reincarnation in plato's republic it's just the context is different and the way they have explained things are different but reincarnation is a widely accepted idea across the world and uh, i mean let's talk about the ancient times and because uh, the modern world is far more rationalized uh, or so called rationalized and kind of uh, not really uh, you know uh, receptive about all these things but you know ancient world was far more connected that than we can think because i have already said this uh, many times but ancient and medieval worlds were far more connected that uh, you know it's difficult for us to even imagine yeah. uh, how how much connection there was because uh, you know just like you mentioned reincarnation uh, uh, see if it's difficult to kind of explain uh, all the facets of uh reincarnation but uh, let's talk from a universally uh, you know let's let's not say universally accepted point of view at least let's say that it's my point of view so reincarnation is kind of uh, you know this this atman inside you this which is called the soul it's yes. called as atman in sanskrit yes. so the soul does not it, it does not die or it does not grow or it does not mature or it does not have any uh, you know changes in itself uh and it's just omnipresent and it is just there but what happens is this physical body which is called as buddha uh in uh india 
it it kind of takes different forms so the soul enters into different different forms and and it kind of you know uh, uh let's say it is a different lifetime if you believe that this particular person has many lifetimes so be it or if you say mm-hmm. that this person does not have many lifetimes but his soul kind of passes on to different physical uh, uh physical bodies uh, which has uh you know which has a mortal life we are all spiritual beings as robert wilkinson one of my uh you know let's say mentors he says that life is a spiritual experience uh, and if you accept that life is a spiritual experience you have to believe in reincarnation because once the you know uh, once you reach that level of accepting that life is a spiritual experience this uh, the soul can, soul is always portrayed in such a way that uh, uh, jyoti or light so a soul kind of uh, in various videos you can see that soul kind of uh, comes out of the body and the body lies and soul kind of travels across and finds another person and goes inside so that's the, let's say let's just keep it as simple as that and that's just that's the journey of the soul yeah. but if you ask me i am not really sure whether if the physical body of me is it different from a soul i am not really sure because that is no one has an experience of it or no one neither we neither can we prove it nor can we disprove it so uh, there is no point in having a debate of whether reincarnation exists or not but as far as both greek and vedic tradition goes i'm talking about greek and vedic yeah. greek also persian yeah because these are the very uh, ancient traditions that we have uh, in you know that we can kind of get in touch with today uh, at least in form of some texts so had the or or kind of pre this idea of reincarnation and it pretty much existed everywhere so and it, the, the nature or the fundamental of reincarnation always remained the same yeah uh, except so that you will find a little that, bit of differences yeah. here and there when it comes to yeah sorry i was just going to say it's so funny that india like gets no, all done. for the reincarnation thing you know they get all this credit but actually like it was just commonly accepted and it's funny because yeah. like for example in the bhagavad gita it doesn't try to like prove reincarnation it just says the case like yeah this is the case you know what i mean like souls reincarnate or they do this or they do that and stuff but it's like it was just a given thing in ancient times that that was how it worked and if you think about it like it kind of does make it seem a lot more just why one baby might be born blind or deaf or something and another not it wouldn't make any sense if that was like your yeah. own life you know that wouldn't seem right so I was really yeah I think it's really funny it's something that the modern world needs to hear and know that even in the Greek philosophies which our entire western world is based on they yeah. also accepted reincarnation you know yes so, for sure um anyway so it's kind of funny to think like maybe in a past life I was in India and you were in here for whatever and, no, and- maybe many people kind of say that to me so so the this idea of uh, philosophy uh or or the nature and reason for why philosophy even existed uh, kind of was the same reason for uh, you know every uh, geographical region across the country sorry across the world so uh, everyone needed philosophy to kind of know the way of life otherwise people would have been killing each other and you know you know i for i for nay makes the world blind that's what gandhi said so we all needed some kind of philosophy and some kind of uh law and order to kind of keep the human beings or or the man who is always greedy to kind of mm-hmm. uh, keep him in check we all need a philosophy law and order so philosophy is one of those important things based upon which uh all the other uh, traditions kind of uh flourished so and uh, i want to talk about one more thing here is that uh, i i don't think uh, i've just started reading aristotle stuff recently and uh, I, i just feel like aristotle does not get enough credit for what he has done because if you read rigveda the texts in rigveda and some of the uh, you know some of the uh, verses in rigveda that talks about uh the 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 nature of fire air water uh, and earth uh, is 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 pretty much same as what aristotle says and aristotle's philosophy was so important that so many greek astronomers and astrologers and medieval 
uh, astronomers and astrologers based their work on aristotelian philosophy yeah which kind of uh, laid which kind of laid a foundation to a lot of major works that we fortunately are reading today so and it's no different from what is there in rigveda So, and so much uh, of the, you know, so much of the foundation of Western culture is in Aristotle, you know, yeah. and you know, I mean, our, you go to college, you join a fraternity, Kappa Kappa Delta Pi, it's all this Greek stuff, you know, all these Greek ideologies and stuff um, still being carried over. And I think Aristotle was also the person who first kind of explained that a story should have like act one, act two, and act three to it as well. Like he kind of like did a lot for storytelling i believe as well if i remember correctly but maybe not but okay so i have another question okay. for you, all right 